So, uh, as thank you for the introduction. As mentioned, my name is Connor Hookstra. Um, I go by code underscore report online. And uh, this is the first time I'm giving this talk, uh, my least favorite anti-pattern. Um, so I'll quickly go through this about me slide, seeing as I was already introduced. Um, as mentioned before, I'm a senior, senior library software engineer for work on the Rapids AI team. So if you are interested in end-to-end uh, -end data science pipeline that goes on the GPU, something similar to Pandas in Python, uh, but that is accelerated, check us out at rapids.ai. Um, as mentioned, I am a programming language enthusiast, so even though my primary expertise is in C++, um, I'm learning uh, several languages at any given time. Um, I recently founded am, and the sole organizer of the Programming Languages Virtual Meetup, so there will be a slide and a link at the end if you're interested in joining that meetup. Um, I love algorithms and beautiful code so much. Um, I have a YouTube channel, and uh, as mentioned before, my online alias is Code Report. Uh, so before we jump into the talk, I just want to mention um, that something that was mentioned on the most recent CPP cast episode, uh, which is this Black Lives Matter movement that's currently going on. I just want to personally state in the midst of this that I support Black Lives Matter. And I think as a C++ community, um, we should support this. Uh, as Rob Irving, uh, one of the co-hosts of CPP cast said, uh, I don't think this is really a political issue. It's a human rights issue. Um, so the organization that I personally work for has tweeted out support for the Black Lives Matter movement. So has Bryce, who is the CUDA uh, team lead at NVIDIA, um, and a number of other senior individuals uh, in the C++ community. So Titus Winters, uh, Chandler Carruth, uh, Eric Niebler. And although these individuals aren't speaking on behalf of their organizations, I think it's awesome that these senior individuals in the C++ community are um, speaking out in support of this movement. And uh, there looks like there's about 120 people that are watching this live right now and hopefully more later online. Um, I'm going to post a link in the chat, hopefully it comes up now, um, to this tweet that CPP cast, which I consider sort of one of the voices of the C++ community, um, they tweeted out in support of the Black Lives Matter movement. So. Uh, in this tweet, it links to um, some organizations, the Black Lives Matter uh, website, ACLU, and a number of other tech organizations that you can support. Um, at a bare minimum, uh, the least we can do is to tweet this out, retweet it, like it, and share it with people so that we can show that in the C++ community, um, we support the Black Lives Matter movement and diversity and inclusivity. Uh, so with that being said, um, let's jump into the talk. So this talk starts uh, from a talk that I recently gave at the 2020 PyCon online conference. Um, and in this talk, uh, the talk was titled Beautiful Python Refactoring. I introduced this anti-pattern that I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, so for the first bit, I'm going to show sort of uh, a few slides that I showed in this talk um, where I first introduced this anti-pattern. And the purpose of this talk that I gave at PyCon 2020 was to take initially a piece of code that was roughly 60 lines of code and then to refactor it down to uh, first 10 lines of code and then even simpler to just like four lines of code. So I'm going to show um, the initial bit of that refactoring, which starts with this for loop here. Uh, so this is Python code. You don't need to be a Python expert in order to understand this. Um, I'll walk you through basically what it is, but it's very similar. It's almost pseudocode. Uh, Python tends to be very easy to read. So the first refactoring that we're going to do with this for loop is by noticing that we're initializing uh, this variable i, and it's going to act as an index. And then for each iteration of our for loop, we're incrementing that index. Um, and one of the things that I point out is that there is explicitly an algorithm or a function in Python uh, that we can use to avoid having to use this variable here. Um, and that function is called enumerate. Uh, so if we use enumerate, what we do is we pass tr elements uh, to enumerate, and that is going to bundle each of the elements in the first row of our tr elements 2D table with an index. And then we can destructure, or in Python they call this iterable unpacking. It's the equivalent of C++ 17 structured bindings, where you take a pair or something that can be destructured, and then you destructure it and name its components. So I here is the index, and T is each of the elements in the first row of this table, TR elements. 
And now we've avoided having to initialize this variable and then modify it for each iteration of our for loop. So that's the first change. Uh, the second change is, oh, so uh, I want to point out that in different languages, uh, we call enumerate uh, different things. So I think most commonly it's known as enumerate. There's currently a proposal uh, for C++23 that I believe Quarantine uh, wrote um, to add enumerate to the ranges library. Um, but in other languages, it's called with index or indexed. Um, so the next change uh, is noticing that the index that we are using from enumerate only gets used in one spot. And that spot is in this print statement. Uh, so this code initially came from a blog that was supposed to be an educational blog. So my guess is that they were adding this line in order to uh, just help out the reader of the code understand or the user of the code understand what it's doing. But at the end of the day, we don't actually need this print statement. Uh, so we can just basically delete the print and the enumerate that we just added. Um, and then that's going to simplify our code to the following. Um, and after this, we can see that we don't really need to name the t.content, the text.content. Um, we can just replace that in a single line. And if you're familiar with Python, when you have this pattern of initializing an empty list and then inside each iteration of your for loop making a call to append, you can replace uh, this pattern with something called a list comprehension. And uh, the equivalent code uh, looks like this for list comprehension. So you sort of have your four in the midst of brackets, and then you're going for four, uh, each element in your list, um, and then you're doing some sort of transformation at the beginning of your list comprehension. Um, so like I said, you don't need to understand Python. This talk is not going to be in Python. But at this point in the talk, uh, I introduced what I call the ITM anti-pattern. And this stands for initialize, then modify. And I point out that two of the three changes that you just saw are this anti-pattern. Uh, so the first one, when we used enumerate, you have an index variable i that then for each iteration of our for loop, we are uh, incrementing. So we're initializing, and then we're modifying. Um, and then for our third change, where we're switching from a for loop uh, to a list comprehension, we have our list call that we're initializing, and then for every iteration of our for loop, we're modifying. And we can avoid this uh, by using list comprehension. So once again, ITM uh, stands for initialize, then modify. And my assertion uh, and the point that I'm going to try and make in this talk is that whenever you see this code, um, you should try to avoid it. Sometimes it won't be possible, but when it is possible, it leads to better code, more readable code, and cleaner code. Um, so. I did not create this anti-pattern. I learned this anti-pattern. Um, and where did I learn this anti-pattern from? From primarily two talks. And so now we're going to take a look at the two talks uh, that I learned this anti-pattern from. The first talk was C++ Seasoning uh, by Sean Parent, which is a talk, if you've seen any of my other talks, I've mentioned this several times. This is one of the best C++ talks I've ever seen. Uh, if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend clicking the link. Um, all the links to the videos that I mentioned in this talk are going to be on my GitHub page. Uh, there's a link at the end of my slides. I highly recommend you go and watch this, but hopefully many of you have already seen it. Uh, so now we are going to watch a clip from that talk uh, where he mentions one of sort of the sub-patterns of ITM. Hopefully this works. So goal number one. No raw loops. I'm going to assume that works. Hopefully, it might be a little bit laggy. Um, but Sean Parent says, no raw loops. If you've watched any of a number of C++ talks from conferences, uh, you will have heard this before. So he says this really early on in the talk at minute 210. And he advocates for avoiding raw loops. So what is a raw loop? What do I mean by a raw loop? Well, a raw loop is anything that's inside a function where that function is doing something that's much more than just that loop. OK, so now we know what a raw loop is. Uh, what are alternatives to raw loops? So alternatives to raw loops. Use an existing algorithm, right? We got a bunch in STL. 
prefer the standard algorithms if they're available. That just makes it easier for the reader of your code to come along and know what you're doing. People know what sort is. So you can avoid using, avoid using raw loops by using existing algorithms, especially the ones in the STL, uh, which if you've seen uh, you know, two of my first several talks, uh, you know that I am a huge fan of algorithms and that uh, I advocate for them very, very strongly. Um, but one of the things I want to highlight is one of the drawbacks that Sean talks about when um, talking about sort of the downsides of raw loops. What variables are modified in that loop? How much do I have to understand the body of that loop in order to figure out what this whole function is doing? So what he said there, what variables are modified in that loop? And after having watched this talk, and going on my journey of uh, learning the algorithms and finding opportunities to use those and looking at raw loops and understanding when, when I can replace that raw loop with an algorithm, I started to notice a pattern. And that pattern was a variable basically being initialized right before a loop and then inside that loop it being modified every single time. Um, we sort of saw this with the Python code earlier where they initialized the index i and then modified it uh, in every iteration. But typically, you're going to see code where you're, you're, you're initializing the result of what you're going to calculate in that loop and then uh, modifying it in each step of your loop. And then at the end of your loop, you basically have the value that you were attempting or trying to calculate. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to look at several examples and I'll be monitoring the chat um, and I'm going to show you a piece of code and the goal is for you to identify what algorithm are we using. Um, so this is the first example. Before you identify which algorithm this is, um, point out two improvements that we can make to the code without removing the for loop in the chat and I will modify, uh, monitor the chat and hopefully there's only about a five to ten second delay. So to reiterate, we're looking for two improvements to this code uh, without um, removing the for loop. Uh, so one of them has been uh, mentioned and that's by using const on our vector. And I see the second one, so that, that was Eula V. And the second one, Brad Lingo, that I'm looking for is using a range-based for loop. So uh, you can see here, we're not modifying our vector v, so we should constify this. And uh, we're not making use of the index in our index-based for loop, so we should just use our range-based for loop. Um, and I've seen several times from, it looks like four or five uh, <laughs> different people, I see a comment, reduce or riot. Uh, from one of the people in the chat. And yes, so the answer to this example, what algorithm is this, is uh, std accumulate or std reduce. I'm using the C++11 algorithm here, um, but uh, the C++17 parallel reduce would also work. Um, and so this is great, uh, a fantastic improvement in my opinion, but what's even better about this code? What's a final change now that we can make to this code that makes it even better than the previous code that we had? Const. Yes, we can now add a const to our variable answer. Um, I see a question in the chat, what's the point? Performance will be the same. Uh, well, one of the reasons I just illustrated is that we can now add const to our answer. Um, but I would recommend going and watching the first 30 minutes of Sean Perrin's C++ seasoning talk. He has a whole slide that talks about, uh, a whole part for basically 5 to 10 minutes, where he talks about the downsides of, of raw loops. When you have a loop in the midst of a larger function, it makes reasoning about what that function is doing. Um, it's much, much easier. So these are all trivial examples, but when you have raw loops in the midst of larger functions, it's so easy to accidentally uh, introduce um, com time complexity pessimizations without realizing it. Um, but that's not what this talk is about. Uh, this talk is about the ITM anti-pattern. I highly recommend going and watching the C++ seasoning talk by Sean Parent. He does a better job than I will ever be able to do about convincing you that you should use algorithms. Um, and let's move on to now example two. 
Um, and yeah, someone also mentioned in the chat, understandability, um, you immediately know uh, that you are adding things up without having to look at the content of the for loops. Uh, so this is example two. There's no improvements here. Um, the game is just, once again, identify which algorithm this is. I have four correct answers in a row, and that is stood any of. So here, uh, the key is to notice that the variable that we are initializing before our for loop is a Boolean, uh, which sort of shortens the list of algorithms that it could be, and that we're looking for an element that satisfies a predicate, which here it's checking if the element is even, and then as soon as you find that, you set your answer to true, and then you short circuit, you break out of your for loop. So if we look at the equivalent of this uh, using a standard algorithm, we end up with the following. And so once again, to reiterate, what's the point of doing this? It has the same performance. It's much, at least for me, it's much more difficult to decipher what this code is doing uh, because, okay, I see that there's a for loop, but um, I don't know what this for loop is doing without understanding the content of the for loop. On top of that, I'm modifying this variable and I'm not able to make it const because I have to modify it inside the for loop. Uh, with the std any of, I immediately know what this code is doing. And on top of that, I can constify the result of this algorithm. Um, and on top of that, Sean Parent mentions many other things. Uh, so moving on to the next example, uh, what is this algorithm? And I once again see five correct answers in a row. Uh, this algorithm is indeed count if. I also saw a comment from someone, it's so unfortunate that I have to specify C begin and C end. Um, I definitely could have used the C++ 20 uh, ranges uh, for this code. And I believe GCC, their latest trunk, um, does have the ranges header. Um, so yes. Potentially a great suggestion, I should add the ranges C20 uh, examples to this code. Um, so this previous solution, uh, very similar to what we saw before. And so this is sort of one of my points, is that this code is only slightly different than the any of code. Um, it, does, it just doesn't have the break. And instead of initializing to a Boolean, we're initializing to an integer literal. Uh, so the delta between this code and the previous code is not that big, uh, but they're two completely different algorithms. And it takes a second sort of comparing those pieces of code to figure that out. Whereas if you're using algorithms, uh, you can immediately tell this is a count if and the previous one was an any of. Moving on to our last example for the for loops. Uh, what is the algorithm shown here? So once again, I see four or five correct six answers. Um, and this is sort of a trick question. It's an algorithm we've already seen. It is std accumulate. Um, so the point that I'm highlighting here is point, a point that I've made in many of my talks before. Uh, don't just know your algorithms. Know the default behavior that comes with your algorithms and know that you can override that default behavior. So std accumulate is our fold or reduction algorithm in C++. Um, and by default, it comes with the std plus binary operation. But you can overload that and do many other things, include calculating the product of a list of numbers by overloading that default std plus to uh, std multiplies. And you can overload it with any binary operation in the form of a lambda that you want. So know that the C++ algorithms are customizable, and it's not just the default behavior that you're stuck with. All right, now we are going to go on a digression. Um, and this is a digression on the virtues of const. So we are going to watch a clip from a fantastic talk by Jason Turner uh, talking about why you should always const. And there we have the resulting code. 350 instructions plus a table of data. Does anyone have any ideas for how we might be able to get this to use less overhead? 
So what happens if we make our static ar array here of color data const? So if you don't currently use const anywhere you can, I bet you will after this talk. So this clip from uh, Jason's, I believe it was a keynote at uh, CppCon 2016, uh, blew my mind. Um, I assume many of you have seen it. If you have not, I recommend going and watching the full talk. Um, and just in case it wasn't clear from the laginess of the video, uh, he, by putting const in front of the std array, he took the assembly from roughly 350 instructions uh, down to like nothing, basically. Um, and uh, the point that he makes is that uh, you should use const wherever you want. Um, it's, it's fantastic. And I, I don't think you should be able to argue against using const after seeing this clip. Um, so being able to modify your code or refactor your code to enable adding a const, it helps the compiler in massive ways. Um, so we should always be trying to uh, refactor our code in order to introduce const where we can. Um, and this code is uh, the previous solution that we saw for our uh, std accumulate. And the point that I want to make here is that if we look at the equivalent code in Rust, um, it looks as follows. And by default, uh, variables are const in Rust. Um, they have an opposite keyword in Rust called mut or mute. Um, and this is basically for doing the opposite of what we do in C++. Um, so by default, all their variables are const. And if they want to have a variable that's modifiable, you have to put the uh, mute keyword in front of your variable. Um, and I think it's uh, basically acknowledged within the C++ community that this is the correct default. Um, v uh, Vittorio Romeo um, had a proposal uh, that potentially could have enabled doing this. It's never going to happen um, due to legacy and ABI compatibility. Um, but yeah, the point is, is that uh, newer languages are uh, doing the opposite of what C++ does by default. Um, and another really neat thing that the Rust compiler does is that if you put this keyword in front of a variable and then you don't end up modifying it, the compiler will warn you that you've made a variable modifiable using the mute keyword, but then you haven't modified it. So you can probably uh, just delete that uh, mute and then end up with more sort of constified code. Um, And there's a question there, but I potentially will come back uh, to the end and answer that. Uh, so this is the end of the digression. The point is, use const everywhere that you can, and know that, like in other languages, um, const is being chosen as the default. In fact, I guess in lambdas, that's the one place in C++ where we got const as the default. If you want uh, the variables captured in your initialization list, of your uh, lambda, your init list, you have to mark the lambda as mutable. Um, so if we could go back, I'm pretty sure we would have done the same thing as Rust. So the second talk uh, that inspired the ITM anti-pattern is easy to use and hard to misuse by Ben Dean. Um, this is probably one of my favorite talks that I've seen in C++, similar to C++ seasoning. It won the best presentation at C++ now in 2018. Highly recommend, if you haven't seen it, uh, to go and watch it. Uh, but now let's take a look at a clip from that talk. Now, I know what many of you are thinking when you, when you see this. Um, so, so All right, I'm seeing that we lost sound. Uh, I'll try and play the clip again, uh, but potentially the sound is no longer being captured. So let me know if there's still no sound. Now, I know what many of you are thinking when you, when you see this, and probably, you know, since we're all in this room, 
uh, au fait with C++, you're thinking of an immediately invoked inline initializing Lambda expression. As many eyes as you like, Lambda expression. And this, this, this might be good, depending on your code base style. This, uh, this avoids the initialization declaration split. This allows us to make the const, although I didn't put it up here. Um, so, so this is a pretty good alternative. So sorry about it losing the audio like the second in time round like that worked. Um, so a couple things he mentions, this I plus LE immediately invoked Lambda expression. And he points out that um, this pattern as well enables you to use const. Um, so let's take a look. Um, and, and one of the other things he says is that it avoids the initialization declaration split. Um, I'm not sure if this has been said in former talks, but when I watched this talk, um, this was the first time that I had heard this sort of anti-pattern, this initialization declaration split. So here is an example um, that violates or that has ITM. Um, and let's talk about how we can refactor this. So we have uh, our variable pet that we are initializing to just be an empty string. And then based on whether or not you are cool, uh, you set your pet to be a cat. Otherwise, you set your pet to be equal to a dog. Um, so what is a very simple, uh, I already see it in the chat, um, a refactoring that we can do to make this better. And that is by indeed using the ternary operator. Um, so uh, the ternary operator in most cases it is a great uh, refactoring uh, for this example at least. I know there are cases where um, the ternary operator is less great. But for this one, I think it's, it's much better than the previous code. Compared to what we have is one, two, three, four, five, six lines of code. We have a single line of code, and it's much more readable in my opinion. And on top of this, we can also make pet const, which as you'll see is a theme in this talk. Whenever you can make things const, we should prefer to do that. Um, however, what if instead of just setting our variable uh, pet to either A or B, or cat or dog, we have some other logic and stuff that's going on. Um, and if this is the case, it's a lot harder to use the ternary operator, sometimes impossible. And in this case, we can make use of the I plus LE, the immediately invocable, inlineable, as Ben mentioned, as many I's as you want, lambda expression. Um, so it, it's a pretty easy transformation. You just add the lambda syntax. Um, you can leave out the parentheses, so it's just two brackets. Um, and then a pair of braces. And the key is to, in order to immediately invoke it, is to put the two parentheses at the end of your code. Um, and Ben mentions that depending on your code style, this may or may not be okay. I am a huge fan of this. Um, primarily, one of the reasons is because uh, other languages are adding uh, things uh, like if expressions. Um, so I believe that is where we are going to enter our second digression. And I'm going to talk about uh, very, very briefly, expressions versus expressions statements. Versus statements. Um, and uh, all I'm going to say about expressions and statements is that expressions yield values and statements do not. Um, and in general, if you watch Ben Dean's talk, uh, it becomes clear that whenever you are able to, you should prefer expressions. Um, and it's because it, it's more declarative, it's more readable, when you have a statement like an if statement or a for loop, um, it causes you to have to do more thinking and uh, it causes you to have a harder time understanding what that code does. Whereas with expressions, when you just have a single li line where you're doing an assignment uh, or declaration or initialization, you just know immediately what the result of that expression is, um, which typically is much better. Um, at one point, I made a, a video on my YouTube channel called Kotlin uh, versus C++ uh, if expression and immediately invoked lambdas. And we're now going to watch a short clip from that video, which is a clip from another video of Andre Breslov, who's the uh, language implementer of Kotlin. Um, and he's remarking uh, the following. This example of code with uh, my if statement is something I really hate about my, my code in Java. Uh, because it's uh, like these assignments here, uh, they all fall apart so easily. So I really like to do uh, things like this in Kotlin. So if and many other things are actually expressions. This is something pretty unfamiliar uh, for the C language family. False. Black bear. <laughs> 
So, uh, Andre Breslov uh, is correct when he says that uh, if expressions is something not familiar to the C++ uh, sort of, or the C family of languages. Um, however, we can get something that is uh, very similar to the if expression in Kotlin. Um, so you can see here, basically, you're able to assign uh, the result uh, of your if expression to a variable. And by wrapping your if statement inside an immediately invocable Lambda expression, you can get very, very similar code. We still have if statements. This, is, this does not make it an if expression. But by wrapping your if statements in a Lambda expression, you are effectively getting the same thing. Um, and I have some questions. Uh, I can skip back uh, to this code. And uh, people are asking, is pet now here a, uh, is this a lambda? No. So this set of parentheses at the end of your lambda immediately invokes it. And then it executes the body of the lambda expression. Uh, so based on this predicate, which is defined, it's just a Boolean variable. Uh, for me, it's set to true. Um, it's then going to execute and return uh, your cat stood string and then assign cat to pet. So this is not a lambda. Uh, to the right of the equal sign is an immediately invoked lambda expression, uh, which then evaluates to either cat or dog based on what the value of is cool. Um, and I think the way that I coded this, I made this uh, const so you could access it with from, uh, from within the lambda. I think there's been a bit of confusion about that. If this wasn't, uh, I would have to pass this in either by reference or value. So that's a good, that's a good point. Um, so let's skip back ahead to, uh, to this code. So once again, just pointing out that even though we don't have if expressions in C++, we can get something very close to it um, with our uh, immediately invoked Lambda expression. And note, this could be const here, uh, similar to Ben's example. I didn't put it in, uh, but we could have it. Um, and w one other point that I want to make is that uh, there are certain languages that are expression-only languages. Uh, so in Elixir, uh, which is basically a newer version of Erlang, if you're familiar with that language, and it, it takes sort of the syntax of Ruby and the concurrency model of um, Erlang and then steals some ideas from Haskell and Clojure, um, this is an expression-only language, uh, which means that everything in the language is an expression and yields a value. Um, which can be a bit confusing when I first started learning Elixir. So uh, on the first line, we have if true, do 42, else 55. So this is similar to many languages where you have sort of an if-else expression. This is the same thing that we saw in Kotlin. Uh, because we have true here, A is going to be set to 42. So when we print out A, we get 42. However, they also allow if expressions that don't include an else. Um, and so if your if expression doesn't uh, yield true for the predicate, uh, the value that gets assigned to the variable here is nil, um, which is an interesting language design choice. You know, you can argue with whether that's a good choice or a bad choice. But the point is, is that there are certain modern languages that are completely doing away with statements and making everything an expression. Um, and so, yes, the point being, expressions, you should try to prefer over statements uh, because you end up with more readable code. Um, that is the end of that digression. And uh, at this point, we're going to review um, what we've covered so far for ITM. Um, so the first ITM pattern uh, that you should try to avoid is raw loops. And this comes, at least uh, I heard it first, from Sean Parent. Um, the second is the initialization declaration split. And this comes from Ben Dean, or at least that's who I heard it from first. Um, however, there is a third uh, pattern that falls into the ITM category that you should try to avoid, and that is non-RAII code. So after seeing the Ben Dean talk, um, easy to use, hard to misuse, uh, was when this sort of ITM pattern uh, started to crystallize. And then later on, um, when I was doing code reviews, I started to notice the same thing with code that wasn't using RAII. Um, RAII, for those not familiar, is uh, resource acquisition is initialization. And it's the idea that you should try and build your user-defined types uh, 
such that um, they are set up and good to go from scratch, and they will do all the management uh, in the destructor uh, and constructor of your class. Um, so this is an example of some code that I'm sure we have all seen at one point uh, or time in our career. We have a struct or a class, a user-defined type, um, and we initialize this type uh, or construct this type by just using the implicit default constructor. And then on the following lines after calling this default constructor, we then initialize all the member variables. Um, this code uh, makes my heart sink whenever I see it um, because uh, it can be so much better than this. So I'm sure everybody is thinking in the chat, uh, yes, someone's saying my eyes hurt. Um, it, yes, we, we want to try to avoid this code at all costs is what we want is a constructor um, that initializes our variables, our member variables, height and width. Um, so this is just slideware. I know there's better ways to do this. Um, but now we are able to construct and initialize our object at the same time. And on top of this, we can now add const uh, to our rectangle R, um, which is much better. Yes, someone's mentioning in the chat uh, why not use a class? Yes, uh, ideally uh, we would want this to be a class, but um, we're just trying to highlight uh, ITM here. Um, you can pretend this is a class uh, with private and public if you wish. Um, and when I added this, uh, when I made this change to the code, I then went on um, to use more strong typing, which is not something I'm going to talk about um, in this talk. Uh, but it is something, a topic that I will give it, something that bothers me here is when you have the two and the three. It's so easy to swap uh, these and actually accidentally end up setting your width is two and your height is three. Um, so on Compiler Explorer, uh, you have access to Jonathan Bacara's named type from his uh, Fluence library. Um, there's a number of examples. Uh, I know Jonathan Mueller, he has a safe type or a type safe, which is very similar to this. Um, but in my opinion, preferring an interface that relies on stronger typing uh, that necessitates you or um, means you have to add this to the interface. To me, I like this much better um, because you know now you're never going to mix up uh, your height and your width. Um, In the chat, someone's saying, in this case, there's no need for a constructor. I guess that's true. With a struct, they already have an implicit one that you can add that. Um, so that's a good point. But in a non-trivial case, you definitely will need the constructor. So uh, as I mentioned, I'm not going to talk about strong typing. Uh, look forward to a future talk on that. But I just thought I'd highlight it here. Um, another example of, in this case, it's not that we don't have a constructor. It's just that we're not utilizing uh, the constructor that we could be utilizing here. So I could ask, but I know that all of you know the answer. Um, and uh, yes, I have seen this code in, produ in production code um, where you're uh, creating some data structure and then calling pushback or whatever the equivalent of the pushback is on the data structure. In C++11, uh, we got the initializer list constructors, and so we should rely on those whenever we can. So yes, this is an extremely trivial example, um, but uh, we should prefer code like this. And once again, um, we have the ability to use const now because we're not making modifications. Uh, we're able to uh, basically construct it all in one go. Um, someone, someone mentions using placeback. Just kidding. Uh, yes, for certain cases, uh, you could use in placeback, but that's not what we're highlighting here. And for integers, it doesn't matter anyways. Um, so, to recap, ITM, initialize, then modify. There are uh, three patterns or sub-patterns that fall into this anti-pattern. Uh, as mentioned before, raw loops, which are introduced in uh, Sean Parent's C++ seasoning talk, the initialization declaration split, which is introduced in Ben Dean's uh, easy-to-use, hard-to-misuse talk, and then the non-RAII code, 
uh, which is something that I just realized after having sort of internally uh, come up with this anti-pattern. Um, so how do we avoid the ITM anti-pattern? As mentioned before, one, use algorithms. Two, use I plus LE and the turning operator. Um, three, use RAII. And all of these enable more const. Um, and there's one thing I want to sort of uh, talk about, and that's with a question that I get with respect to using algorithms. Um, I get this question all the time. Uh, you'd be surprised how many times after conferences when I give a talk about advocating for algorithms. Uh, some people, they come up and they say, sometimes I just need a for loop. Um, and the point that I want to highlight, and this is a mistake that I sort of made the first time I watched C++ Seasoning, um, Sean Parent doesn't advocate for not using loops. He advocates for not using raw loops. Not using raw loops and not using loops are two different things. Raw loops do not equal loops. If we go back and listen to how he defined raw loops, uh, what does he say? What do I mean by a raw loop? Well, a raw loop is anything that's inside a function where that function is doing something that's much more than just that loop. So Sean Parent is talking about how if you have a loop and that's the main body of, uh, or that's the main purpose of that function or algorithm, that's completely fine. What he's against is inserting loops uh, into larger functions that are doing way more than what that one uh, function could be doing. Um, and I actually didn't really realize this or understand this until I watched another talk of his that was given uh, shortly just before he gave this talk, um, but is on a completely different uh, YouTube channel. Um, so Sean Parent gave a keynote at BoostCon 2012, before it was C++ Now, called Now What? A Vignette in Three Parts. Now, the audio for this isn't great, um, so do your best to make out what he's saying, uh, but I will highlight the part that's important afterwards. No raw loops. This is, you know, people ask me, like, how do they improve the programming? Uh, one of my final plans is no raw loops. Don't stick a loop in the middle of your function, okay? Unless that function is explicitly an algorithm. Uh, this is both from a code function standpoint and code readability standpoint. It's also when you're trying to, to make things run fast and parallelize them, then you can start to say, okay, here are my algorithms. Can I parallelize this algorithm? Uh, can I move this off the GPU? How do I have this happen? So like I said, the audio is not great, but the important part, don't stick a loop in the middle of your function unless that function is explicitly an algorithm. And I know that there's people out there that uh, conflate no raw loops with no loops. Um, almost every algorithm is written with a loop. It is completely fine to code using loops in C++. Uh, the point that Sean is making is to isolate those loops and turn them into algorithms. Um, so don't conflate no raw loops with no loops. Loops are great, just not in the midst of larger functions. If you have a loop, refactor it out into an algorithm. Um, and the next part of my talk focuses on another talk. And this is basically unintentional support for ITM. So uh, Jason Turner gave a talk at CPPCon uh, 2019, which was called C++ Code Smells. And in this talk, he has a number of examples or slides of code where he works with the audience to identify what the, what the problem with the uh, code on his slides are. Um, and many of these examples are examples, at least the initial code before it's refactored, are examples of ITM. Um, so the, this is the very first one. It's, a, it's essentially just ITM. Um, there's nothing else going on. He just has it commented out, do some stuff, work with uh, STR. He has stood string, and, uh, and then he's setting it to string equals hello world. Um, so his very first example in C++ code smells is essentially ITM. Um, and uh, all of these uh, code smells he took off of Twitter from individuals. And this was a, an example actually provided by Ben Dean. Um, and in, in this example, uh, he, doesn't he, he doesn't refer to it as uh, the initialization declaration split. He refers to it as the construction uh, assignment split. Um, but they're essentially the same thing. Um, but when I watched this talk, at, at this point in time, I had sort of had this internal ITM pattern. I couldn't believe that. I was like, oh, wow, the first code smell is ITM. 
Then the second code smell is essentially ITM. Um, in this, uh, the code smell here is um, out parameters, um, but although the code smell is not, you know, directly ITM, the code that is resulting from it is ITM. So you're initializing your string value and then passing it as a parameter, um, at which point you're going to modify it. Um, if we avoid out parameters, uh, we can basically avoid uh, having to declare this on a separate line and we can avoid ITM. So this is the second example. The third example is a for loop. Um, and once again, very similar to the, uh, to the example that I had, you're declaring a Boolean, setting it to true, and then inside that for loop, making modifications. Um, so this is almost identical to the example that I had. Uh, so this is the first. This is the first three examples of Jason Turner's C++ code smells talk that are all basically examples of ITM. Um, he then later goes on to show a different anti-pattern, um, or, or sorry, a different code smell. Uh, but in this example, even though he's highlighting something else, he's highlighting uh, these different steps. Um, the example that he has has ITM, initializing a value or a variable called value, and then modifying it inside each of these loops. Um, and then he's got two other examples at the end of his talk where he said, let's just refactor this. Sure enough, on the very first line, he's declaring length and then initializing it later on. So this example violates ITM as well. And then the last uh, example that he shows is also violating ITM as well. Um, so, so many of the examples in Jason Turner's fantastic C++ code smells talks um, are highlighting the ITM anti-pattern. So at one point he summarizes about uh, two-thirds of the way through the talk all the different uh, code smells and I highlighted the ones. The first three um, are essentially uh, things that uh, um, if you do them you are explicitly uh, using ITM. Uh, so avoid these to avoid ITM. And then the last two are examples that were highlighting something else but the initial code also had the ITM uh, anti-pattern in it to begin with. Um, so a fantastic by uh, a fantastic talk by Jason Turner. Highly recommend you go watch this one as well. Um, and while you're watching it, now that you've watched this, um, try and see if you can note all the times where you're uh, violating uh, the ITM anti-pattern. What are the conclusions that we've come to so far? One thing that keeps coming up that hasn't really been explicitly mentioned. I'm going to walk through these review. What do you see here? Cons. What do you see here? Cons. What do we see here using the algorithms? More constable. So, what kept coming up? Cons. It's not like this is first time that cons has ever been mentioned at a C++ conference. Now, this, I don't know if this is going to work. So, spoiler alert, uh, it doesn't work. <laughs> but I have the clip from Kate Gregory, which we'll watch in a sec. But so one of the points that I'm making in this talk is that whenever we can refactor our code uh, so that um, we can enable the use of const, we should. Um, and here now is the clip that uh, Jason was going to show but didn't end up being able to show. Marking everything const that you possibly can. Not like, oh, I have to, and then getting away with whatever you don't have to, but turning it around and saying, mark it const unless I absolutely can't. Because then, remember, the compiler is your friend. So, 100% agree. Const everything that you can. Make the compiler your friend. Avoid ITM and enable more const. So avoiding ITM enables more const, which is 100% a good thing. Jason Turner agrees. Kate Gregory agrees. Don't listen to me. Listen to them. <laughs> um, and so to close out, I have uh, two final examples that I want to show. Um, so the first one is, a, I believe, from a tweet that got sent out um, in response to the Python talk uh, that I gave. Um, so the individual said, thanks for the talk. Um, however, I'm having trouble um, avoiding the ITM anti-pattern 
with the following piece of code. Um, so here is this piece of code blown up. If you want to compare, you can see that they're the same. And in order to make it more understandable for myself, I added the actual, uh, or an example, I just made it up of the dictionary that the individual mentions. Uh, so essentially what this code is doing is it is trying to go through each of the votes. So you have a dictionary uh, with a person's name for the key. And then for the value, you have a list of votes that I believe the people are trying to nominate someone. So you're allowed to nominate multiple people. And this piece of code is, is going through all the nominations. So it ignores the keys and goes through all the nominations and then creates a basically a frequency count of how many times each person is voted for. Um, so I was confused initially. So if we walk through this code, we're initializing nom count dict uh, to be a dictionary, and then we're going for each uh, uh, key value pair and nominated. Uh, we're then going for each name in the nominated list of that key value pair. Uh, if the name uh, doesn't exist in our dictionary, nom count dict, um, set that name equal to one, otherwise add one to it. Um, so the first thing I was a bit confused about was the first two for loops. I'm not a Python expert, and I actually wasn't familiar that you could uh, iterate over a dictionary, and then the second uh, range-based for loop would give you the values. Uh, so the first thing that I did was I refactored it to how I am more familiar with looping over dictionaries. If you call the dot items on a dictionary in Python, you can then use uh, iterable unpacking or destructuring to get out both the key and the value. Um, but if you're discarding the key, um, you can actually just use uh, dot values. So if we don't want the key, you just use dot values. And I've seen in the chat uh, two or three different people already mention um, the next optimization. And that is using a default dict, uh, default dictionary. So you can see here on the final four lines, um, we're checking does it exist? If it doesn't, uh, set it equal to one. If it does, just add one to whatever the current value is. In Python, there is an explicit data structure for this in the collections module. Uh, called default dict. Uh, so 1000% for the individuals who mentioned that. Um, the way you use this is to basically specify the type of your default dict. And then now we can get rid of those two, uh, the conditional statements, so the two lines here, and then the two separate lines where we're setting equal to one and then adding one. We can get rid of all of that and just use plus equals one, which is similar to what we have um, with the C++ uh, map and unordered map. Um, the next thing, I've seen uh, an optimization or, or a, a refactoring that we're going to do uh, two from now. Um, but the next thing we want to do is we have these two for loops. So we're looping through the values in our dictionary, so these lists. But because we have multiple lists, we have to have another for loop that says uh, for each of the names in these votes. But ideally, what we would really want is this resulting sort of two-dimensional list, this list of lists we want to be able to flatten that um, into a single list. Um, and in many languages, this is called flatten. Uh, some languages call it uh, concat. Some languages call it join. When you're working with a list of lists in Python, uh, the algorithm that you want is in the iter tools module, and it's called chain. Um, so we can remove one of the for loops by basically flattening our list of lists here uh, by using the iter tools dot chain, and you have to pass it an asterisk at the front. But at this point, you flattened all of your names um, into a single list. Um, and at this point, I've now seen yet yeah, uh, from a couple different people, you can make use of not an algorithm, but a data structure that does exactly this pattern that we're doing right now. Um, so uh, when you have a dictionary and you're using it to keep track of all of the times a certain element shows up so that you can get basically a frequency count, Python has a data structure called counter, which I've seen mentioned a couple times in the chat, which is exactly for this purpose. Um, so you can basically, uh, finally, we've gotten to the point where we can avoid the ITM anti-pattern by making use of uh, the counter data structure. Um, 
And now we have exactly what we want without um, doing any sort of initializing and then modifying. And I pointed out in the tweet that if you really need a dictionary at the end of the day, because I believe this is uh, specifically a, a counter data structure, you can just cast this to a dictionary um, and have the dictionary that you, you want. But my guess is that um, a counter is just as good as a dictionary um, for most of the cases. Um, so this was the code that I, I tweeted. If you run this, I believe it's hard to see, um, but you'll end up with cat as the most nominated with three nominations. Bob has two nominations. And then Sam and Jen uh, both have one nomination. Um, so this is an example of starting with code that looks less likely because you have a lot going on. You have if statements. You have for loops. Uh, step by step, if you refactor, you can get to a point where you are completely avoiding the ITM anti-pattern, um, which is exactly what we want. So this code makes me very happy, um, or at least it makes me more happy than the previous code. However. I'm not a huge fan of the nesting. Um, so you have to sort of read inside out to figure out what this code is doing. First, you're getting the values from our dictionary. Then you're flattening them with chain. And then you're passing that to counter. Um, however, in what is becoming one of my favorite languages, Clojure, um, you can do the exact same thing much more elegantly. Um, so in Clojure, this is the exact same uh, code. <laughs> I just saw another comment from someone that said Piper Riot. So this is the equivalent of piping, um, which is this sort of pattern where you are feeding the output of one algorithm uh, to another algorithm as its input. Um, and so Clojure, for those of you that don't know, is a Lisp dialect. Um, the main language implementer is an individual by the name of uh, Rich Hickey. He has given some absolutely fantastic talks. I highly recommend them. Um, but he has done some amazing work. So one of the things that you may or may not have heard about Lisps, depending on how familiar you are with them, is Lisps are notorious for having uh, tons and tons of parentheses. And that's why a lot of people um, aren't big fans of Lisp dialects, because they have parentheses all over the place. Um, and this was initially what turned me off of Lisps as well. When I first saw uh, my first couple examples of Lisp code, I was like, whoa, there's just parentheses. You get this huge chain of like 10 parentheses at the end. Um, you can see in this code, we have our, uh, our dictionary, or our hash map, as they're called, and enclosure here. And we only have four parentheses in the equivalent code. In fact, if we go back to the Python code, there's less parentheses in the, in the closure code than there are in, or there's less parentheses in the closure code than there are in the Python code. Um, so what this code is doing is it's basically taking our nominated hash map, um, and then this is the equivalent of our, val our dot values in Python. This is the equivalent of our chain. And frequencies is an algorithm for doing what counter does in Python. Um, and because we're using this thrush operator, um, it's also known as a threading macro. Uh, Racket has these as well. Instead of a hyphen, it uses a tilde. Um, we're, we're enabling piping the output of each of these algorithms to be the input of the next one. Um, anyways, I highly recommend uh, looking into uh, Clojure or Racket and uh, learning about um, threading macros because they are absolutely beautiful. And I think my next slide is, um, I guess, just zooming in on this, which we've already looked enough at. Um, but the slide after this is uh, in the programming languages virtual meetup. Um, we're working our way through the structure and interpretation of computer programs right now. And I believe in early chapter two, it might have been chapter one, um, there's an example of calculating an approximation of pi using Leibniz's, or Leibniz's uh, formula. Uh, and using the threading macro in Racket, you end up with this, um, what I consider extremely elegant solution, uh, which takes the first n odds, depending on how precise you want your approximation to be, um, then chunking them by groups of two, multiplying those chunks, uh, dividing them by eight and sort of taking the inverse and then adding them up. Um, and here you get an approximation for pi. And anyways, if you have sort of opinions on lists and uh, that they have too many parentheses, I would uh, highly encourage you to reconsider because um, they're very beautiful in my opinion. And last but not least, example number two um, is from a YouTube video that I posted several months ago. Um, that covered a problem 
uh, from the Leap Code competitive programming website. So I, I covered the solution in 13 different languages. We're not going to look at all of them. In fact, we're only going to look at the Python one. Um, but this problem states, given an M by N matrix grid, which is sorted in non-increasing order, both row-wise and column-wise, uh, return the number of negative numbers in the grid. Um, so note that for this problem, I did not solve this in the most performant way possible. Um, I ignored the fact that the values in this n by n grid are sorted. Um, I basically uh, used this as an example to compare the different uh, algorithms for solving this sort of in a functional compositional way. Um, so I didn't solve this optimally. I solved this to highlight like the different uh, ways to flatten and filter and reduce. Um, and if we take a look at how you might solve this, uh, you're going to see we have a 2D matrix. Uh, here are all your negative numbers. You can turn this 2D matrix into a 1D uh, vector uh, by flattening it. We can then filter out the positive or non-negative numbers and then just take the length of the resulting filtered list and um, you end up with your answer. Uh, so as I said, this is not the most efficient way to solve this problem, but my goal wasn't to solve this in the most efficient way. It was to compare uh, the different um, uh, names of the algorithms in different languages. So if we take a look at all of those, I'm not going to spend much time on this. Um, feel free uh, to you know check out the recording afterwards. Um, but you can see that uh, we have filter and length in our uh, Python solution. In our Ruby, we have flatten and count. In C++, with our ranges, we have join, filter, and distance. And it, it lists out all the equivalent algorithms in the different languages that I cover. However, like I said, we're only going to look at the Python solution. And this is the first solution that I show. Uh, so we have our function def, def count negatives. It takes a list of lists of ints. And right at the top of our solution, we are setting our uh, answer to be 0. We then have two nested for loops for each of the rows in our grid and for each of the elements in our row. If it's less than 0, we add 1 uh, to our answer. Um, and once we're done this nested for loops, you just return the answer. Um, this, overwhelmingly, is the solution that you will see on the forums that post solutions on how to solve this. Um, and I point out in my video, although this is probably what you learned in school and what you see everyone coding, um, this violates the ITM anti-pattern. Um, you don't want to write code like this. Um, and I, this was the first time publicly that I sort of had mentioned ITM. The first time in a conference was in the Python, uh, the PyCon 2020 talk. And I show that you can do this in a single line using something called a generator expression. Um, and a reduction algorithm sum. Uh, you're basically, you've got your two nested, um, your genera er, generator expression that nests for j in grid and for i and j, uh, i less than zero. A couple people criticized that technically this returns a Boolean and then you're summing up Boolean. So if you wanted, you could actually map this uh, to an integer one or zero, uh, but it still works like this. My point being is that uh, the previous code completely violates ITM. Um, and this code does not. You should prefer the generative expression uh, code. It's more declarative, in my opinion, more readable. Um, however, I posted this uh, on Reddit. So enter Reddit, uh, which is probably a mistake. We should probably never go to Reddit to have um, discussions. Uh, I posted this video on the uh, r slash programming subreddit. Um, and uh, I posted it uh, 13 different programming languages, uh, one problem. And one of the comments that I got was the following. Uh, the unidiomatic, old-fashioned, mutating Python method is the one that every developer from every language will immediately be able to decipher what it does. Um, and I responded, I agree with your statement. So I don't think this individual is wrong. Uh, I think they are absolutely correct. Um, the largest number of programmers across every language will be able to read the ITM code. I then go on to say, however, you don't state whether you think this code is objectively better, which I would adamantly argue it is not. It's an artifact of our CS education system, and therefore the implicit quote-unquote internet education 
that is available that more people are able to read the nested for loops in Python compared to the Ruby solution. Um, and the Ruby solution is just invoking two algorithms chained together, flatten and count, and you're counting the elements when they're less than zero. Um, and I point out that, in my opinion, the Ruby code, without any knowledge of computer science, uh, is objectively more readable and understandable. Um, however, this stuff doesn't get taught in university. Um, they teach you for loops. They teach you if statements. Um, and, and they don't teach this kind of code, at least in the majority of CS programs that I know. Um, and what's really interesting is that later on in the discussion, um, the same individual points out that, you know, we don't need your, uh, your sort of compositional code, your functionally compositional code. I just want to count something. Um, and so this was, this was his words, uh, his or her words. I, I don't know. Um, and I, I just found it incredibly uh, ironic or, or paradoxical that in the language that they're using to talk about what we wanted to do, they're naming one of the algorithms that we could be using. Um, and, and so this, this individual is, is halfway to already arguing for like the functional programming, sort of more declarative, uh, functional compositional style. Um, and they just, they just can't come to terms with it. Um, anyways, I, I later on, uh, in, in the post, like I, I thank the person and say, you know, even though we're on different sides of the argument, I, I really do appreciate, uh, the engagement um, because I think this discussion needs to be had. I think a lot of people that go and are actively on their free time watching talks online, um, they agree with a lot of this, um, it, but the wider community uh, does not. So uh, my point here is that there isn't agreement on this topic, and I encourage you, if you do agree with uh, Sean Parent and Jason Turner and Kate Gregory and Ben Dean and myself, um, talk about this with your colleagues. Talk about this in, in forums that aren't necessarily uh, going to be as receptive to this um, because I would prefer there to be a lot more opportunities for individuals um, to work in environments and code bases where sort of this is the primary um, paradigm and style. But uh, there's a large swath of, of, of companies and code bases that, that don't agree with what I'm sort of asserting in this talk. Um, and with that, I will recap once again. Uh, ITM, initialize, then modify, sort of has three patterns. There's a bug on this code that should say three. I apologize. One, raw loops comes from Sean Parent. Two, the initialization declaration split, or as in uh, Jason Turner's C++ code smells talk, it was termed the construction assignment split, uh, which was pointed out by Ben Dean, and the non-RAI code, RAII code. How do you avoid this? Once again, use algorithms, use I plus LE, the immediately invocable Lambda expression, use RAII, and when you use all of these, you'll be able to use more const. Um, so as I mentioned a couple times, uh, if you go to my GitHub under the talks uh, repository, uh, you'll find all of the links for all of the talks that I mentioned in this talk, plus my slides, which I will upload in T minus 10 minutes after this talk is over. Um, I've stolen quite a bit of content from under other individuals, uh, which I always feel bad about. So please go and follow these individuals on Twitter, Sean Parent at, at Sean Parent, Jason Turner at Lefticus, Ben Dean at, at Ben Dean, and Kate Gregory at uh, Greg Cons. It uh, makes up a little bit for me stealing so much content from them. And uh, as mentioned at the beginning of the talk, uh, if you're interested in joining the Programming Languages virtual meetup, um, Follow the link, and thank you. Um, and at this point, uh, I can answer any questions that there are. I know that I haven't been looking at the chat for the last couple of minutes. So then I take the opportunity and thank you. Thanks a lot for the great talk. Um, since you're able to read the, the chat yourself, um, mm -hmm. you just figure out which questions are worth to, to answer. I guess um, going forward, uh, if you have a question, maybe put like a Q and A next to it, so I can more easily identify. Um, okay. So there is a comment, a very um, common comment, I would say, and this is uh, what you also named every programmer from Jumus Tedu. The loop code uses only a few. It's a little up. Perhaps you have to scroll a little bit. 
the kind of comment that I also usually get in my training classes. And this is exactly what I asked Ben Dean uh, two weeks ago. Oh, not, not exactly, almost. Um, how would you respond to that? Yeah, so I, if I'm reading the correct um, comment, it says the loop code uses only a few basic but commonly known flow control mechanisms and keywords, nothing really language specific, and therefore it would also I would also consider it more readable. Um, yeah, this is sort of slightly different than the question that um, Ben got. I remember Ben got the question, you know, I, I, I don't consider algorithms readable because I, mm -hmm. I don't know them well. His response was, start using algorithms and two or three weeks later, it'll be just as readable um, as, as your raw for loops that you're used to. Mm -hmm. This one, I think more is asking, I don't, like, I can take what I know about for loops and if statements from language to language. Um, but for the algorithms, um, as pointed out with sort of the enumerate example, different languages call algorithms different things. Um, and that creates an overhead. Um, so I would consider the for loop and the if statements more transferable. Um, I would, to a certain extent, agree with that. Um, you're not wrong. Uh, for loops are typically called for loops in imperative languages. They don't change that. Whereas um, different algorithms, you know, there's a lot of consistency. I think almost every single language that has filter calls it filter. Almost every single language that has map calls it map. Except for C++, we call it transform. Um, so when, when it comes to sort of the bread and butter algorithms, there typically is uh, they do have the same names, but when it comes to the less well-known algorithms, there is a difference. Um, I guess my, my response to that would be, um, primarily, you're probably only operating in one language. I assume if you're at a C++ meetup, it's C++, which means that you only need to learn the C++ algorithms. And yes, that does require uh, a certain amount of time, um, but like when you are learning about C++ 14 or 17 or 20, like upping your skills and um, increasing your ability to write readable, maintainable code, um, it is going to come with like a certain amount of investment. Um, and I would argue that like the trade-off that you get uh, from using algorithms is, is much, much greater than the investment of time that it takes to get used to using them. So like I agree with your comment that you know for like reading for loops and if statements, um, like that is very readable. But like it's easier to understand a count if or an any of or a transform if you know what those do than it is to understand what any generic raw for loop is doing, um, because they all slightly look the same. And then you have to go and understand what is this loop doing. When I see a count if. When I see an any of, I know exactly what it's doing. Um, QA, what about when std algorithms produce slower code? Um, I've gotten this question several times, and um, my response has always been like, show me an example where uh, an algorithm produces slower code. Um, I think more often than not, like overwhelmingly more often than not, you're going to end up with more performing code than you had before. Um, there are certain algorithms that have different implementations based on the underlying iterator type. A lot of people don't think about that depending on the data structure I'm working with. Um, if you are using a raw for loop, you're going to end up with like uh, way worse time complexity. Um, and if you watch Sean Parent's talk, he very uh, he points out in like a really good way like how easy it is to miss to miss like performance uh, pessimizations. Um, because in a raw for loop, it's it's just so much harder to see uh, and reason about time complexity. Whereas when you're using nth element, when you're using partition, you know those are linear runtime algorithms. Um, and so if you have an example, I'd love to see it. I remember one of the first times I gave a talk locally in Toronto, uh, my site manager um, who doesn't write a ton of code in C++ or at least modern C++, he was watching me give my algorithm intuition talk and he had the exact same thing. And he was like, ah, I'm sure like a raw C 
uh, for loop has got to be faster than an algorithm. He went off, implemented something, was about to come and show me, and then was like, oh, wait, I haven't turned on optimization yet. And sure enough, the code that he ended up writing with an algorithm not only was as fast, but actually generated less instructions, like less assembly code. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I, I, I haven't been presented with any examples that really are slower when using an algorithm. Um, yes, uh, I knew I was going to get this question, Devable. You often use uh, dot cbegin instead of the three methods. I actually realized this last night at like midnight, um, and I had all the gobble links working. Uh, and I didn't want to go back and change it, but um, I actually prefer the free methods, uh, not the dot C begin. Uh, so that was just a mistake when I was preparing for this talk. Um, for the ones we don't have C++ 20, for the ones of us that don't have C++ 20, is there any kind of wrapper that can be done to avoid to have to specify dot C begin and dot C end for every call of the algorithms. Um, I don't know of a wrapper, but you can, if you have access to a package manager, um, you can go use the range v3 li library. So I believe range v3 works with uh, C++ 14. Um, so C++ 20 ranges is based on the range v3 implementation. So uh, if you don't have access to those, my recommendation would be see if you can get your organization um, to use range v3 and then just migrate um, there's also a, there's a couple other different implementations. I know Tristan Brindle, he has uh, the nano ranges, and I believe Microsoft, they also have an implementation. Um, I think that's... Uh, that's the last question that I've seen marked with a Q&A. Someone mentioned that in their code base, they just have like manually wrapped a bunch of um, algorithms so that they can just pass the data structure and behind the scenes pass the iterator. So that's also an alternative, I guess. Yeah, and someone has pointed out, uh, JG424, that range v3 has many more useful algorithms than what is going to be in C20. Um, yes, 100,000%. I was actually trying to code up the C++ 20 uh, ranges equivalent of um, one of the Python examples, and I just gave up after a certain point, because uh, it's just, you're so limited by what you have in C++ 20. Um, uh, so yes, look forward to C++ 23. Uh, over time, we're going to be getting more and more of the range v3 library in. And I think, yes, I see the Hangout chat. Are we, should we swap over to, to that, Klaus? So um, I just posted a link for the uh, after talk chat. Please feel free to join us. We would be very happy to have you. And you can uh, ask Connor questions live. And this is, of course, much better than uh, within the chat. So thanks again, Connor, for the great talk. I think a lot of people already uh, agreed with me that this was definitely worth the time. Um, and so let's let's go over to the after talk chat. All right. Thanks everyone for tuning in.